I guess you know that the, the first global attack on uh, environmental problems was the uh, one recently the United Nations conference had in Stockholm. And they had 114 nations there, so I can't imagine how they could have gotten anything done. But apparently some success did come out of it. Uh, it was a difficult conference. Um, a lot of conflicting interests went on. And I wondered if uh, anyone who's been there uh, felt that much was accomplished. And anthropologist Dr. Margaret Mead just came back from Stockholm. And she's here with us to tell her firsthand what happened. Will you welcome, please, Dr. Margaret Mead. <laughs> How are you? Fine. Someone obviously finds your cape quite fetching, or you, for that matter. Was the conference uh, polluted by politics, or were politicians polluted at the conference? Or well, did there were you... plenty of politics there, you know. There was. Because there were the industrializing countries who said, just give us 1% of your gross national pollution, and we'll be happy. In other words, we just, we'll be glad to have factories polluting our air because we need the dough. Well, and because, you know, they haven't got electricity in their villages yet or drinking water. Yeah. And when they look at it, they feel that pollution is just something we've got uh, because we've got too much of things. And they haven't any because they haven't enough. Can you sympathize with that at all? I can sympathize with it because I know what it means not to have any light, you know. I know what it means the first time you have electric lights in a village. I know what it means to have to carry water three or four miles. But the thing they don't realize, or didn't, you know, a lot went on in Stockholm, but the thing they didn't realize is we're not talking about pollution over New York or Los Angeles. We're talking about the kind of thing that's going around the whole world, and they're going to get it just as much as we do. Did anything come up about the French about to have a nuclear test in the atmosphere, which oh, seems we talked about disgraceful it all the time. The, at the time when they're talking about... And people went around wearing buttons that said, uh, more and more, mon amour. You know, and somebody came and stuck one on me, and I didn't notice too carefully. There it was. It seemed what did it say? Do. More and more, mon amour. You know, it was a takeoff on uh, Hiroshima, Hiroshima oh, mon amour, that and that's the name of the island. Ah, yeah. or, and just that minute, they, I was called out to do a satellite bit for New Zealand, uh, which is just the spot that is most concerned about all this. So suddenly the camera came in on my butt. Yeah. So it was on just in time. Well, what, what was accomplished, or what disappointed you, uh, either way you want to put it? No, I don't think I was disappointed. Um, it would have been a little better if the Russians had come, probably, but they were just as affected as if they had, had come. You know, they announced enormous ecological changes. Just before they came, they were going to do whole riverbeds. They had a big exchange with President Nixon, and they'll be there in the fall. So their not being there wasn't too serious. It, uh, it lowered the intensity about the war. Yeah. The French didn't move out. The Chinese didn't vote against the statement, although they more or less threatened to. And we got, we got what we went for. Anything on whales accomplished? Oh, yes. Of course, the United States is very generous about whales because we don't do much whaling. Yeah. And uh, Japan fought it. Japan wanted to say that we'd only look after endangered species of whales. Well, then you could have argued for the next 10 years of who was endangered. Yeah. But the moratorium went through all whales for 10 years. But it's in the hands of the Whaling Commission, which is uh, pretty, uh, it's like putting a drunk behind the bar, isn't it? Perhaps. We're not sure. Yeah. You know, uh, there was a lot of change in people's thinking during this conference. The mm -hmm. French didn't walk out, even though we did talk about tests. The Chinese didn't vote in the end, you know, against the statement and stop it. Uh, we, we got something started. Yeah. Was there any hope about population control, which is at the bottom of every, I guess, every problem we have? No, I don't think it's yeah. the bottom of everything. It's the top of everything, you know? Well, Babies I, are piling up on top. The, our major problem is the coal technology yeah. and the way we're poisoning the atmosphere and poisoning the ocean. Now, if there weren't so many people, it wouldn't be as bad, of course. But it's not the people. It's the technology that's really serious. And of course, we've got to stop the, the population increase. We've got to level it off and invite, or rather, disinvite, so many babies from being born in this next generation, because it isn't going to be a terribly good place to be born. Uh, the reason I asked you was polluted by politics originally was that I think it was, one of the, I think it was time, or news, uh, time, I believe, gave the impression that every, uh, 
everyone there who was a spokesman had an ambassador or a PR man or somebody with him cautioning him about what he said so that uh, there was more sense of image from of the various countries and well, really maybe that was done. true at the press conference and the United States spent a good deal of time on its image yeah. partly because it had a very mixed delegation and you couldn't count on anybody's image being exactly like anybody else's but most people know and it was quite impressive to have a great big room people from all over the world who'd never been to a UN conference at all before which include most of our representatives managing to get through it you know, sit there with that microphone and manage the protocol that was so complicated. If you went out of the room for two minutes, you thought, you know, that you'd come in another part of a detective story. Because of all the complicated protocol. It's yeah. very complicated. Yeah, they and yet they that. did it. And they did it. It was one committee meeting of a little over two hours when there were 43 interventions from 36 countries. Now, that meant they had to be pretty snappy, almost as snappy as you are. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Did what did you? Huh? I wondered if the Russians have, uh, have been persuaded not to, to stop polluting that big lake in Siberia. What is it, Bakal? It's getting very famous, that lake. Yeah. It's almost yeah. as famous as Lake Erie, you see? Yeah. And we say, hmm, uh, you've got a socialist government and you can't fix Bakal. And they say, look what your imperialist capitalist technology is yeah. doing. And actually, neither of us know what to do with it. Who's yeah. ahead in pollution? Are they ahead of us or are we ahead of them? Uh, it's important well, to know you know, it's one things. of those things one doesn't compete with. Well, too Bacala often. Ha isn't destroyed yet, but if they keep it up, they will. And it's, it's unique on, on the globe, that lake. But Erie is finished. No, it isn't quite. It's creeping back. And we'll be able probably to revive it, but it's going to take a long, long time, an unnecessary long time. We don't have to go around killing lakes and rivers and possibly killing the ocean if we keep on the way we're going. Say. What did you say that got you in trouble at a, with the women's movement? Um, there was an account of a lecture you gave and, and said many of the people in the audience were highly offended at the things you said. And, uh, where was this? You keep up with where I offend people better than I do, you know. Are there you, so many? You, well, I don't know. You usually have one. Oh. So would you tell me where this is and well, I'll tell you what an, I said. This was in an august newspaper and it said that you had been at a conference of church women or a conference about women in the church or something. No, well, that was, a, that that was uh, a long time ago at the cathedral. That was an argument about ordaining women. Well, what, what did you say that irked them? Well, I said I wasn't perfectly certain it was necessary. To ordain women? Yes. I, th I thought we could think of a lot more things for them to do. They well, mean women who wanted to be ministers, literally wanted to be ministers or priests? They or? wanted to be priests. What are the chances of that ever happening? Oh, I think there's a big chance. A lady, uh, you know, because everybody's crumbling before women's lib, mm -hmm. very nicely. <laughs> and but what, how did you, how did you irritate them? Then? That's what. I well, I, because I did said I didn't think it was as important for women to want to do exactly what men did as for women to think up something they might do themselves. Uh -huh. You know, it was different. Yeah. But you wouldn't object to a woman priest or a woman... I uh, wouldn't personally minister. object yeah. at all. But I'm not so interested in women doing everything that men do as in women doing interesting things mm -hmm. and women doing something to stop war, for instance. You know, I don't think doing what men do is exactly a way of stopping war. But you, said, you said that something was... Uh, <laughs> was it? There was some specific thing that seemed to irritate them that you... Oh, uh... There was something about um, God, he is God, or something, and some of the... Uh, I said it didn't improve of... things a bit to call God she. Were some of them... Act <laughs> that's what I didn't understand. Were they actually saying that God should be called some she them, or, or yeah. it rather than he because that, that, that was an indication of some male of them supremacy do. myth or something? And, you know, it's very good practice to try saying she for a change. For instance, if you're writing early, writing early history about man, early mm -hmm. man, you know, and you read a sentence like... Um, Man lost his fur because mm -hmm. it was so hot when he was out hunting. Now try putting she into that. See, that ought to be right up your line. Try putting she into our father, which art in heaven. It doesn't work. Well, it's you, father. Well, then you'd say mother. Man lost her fur? You know, you see what you yeah, I mean. Yeah, But are there actually people who want religious myths changed to a neutral gender? Uh, or even to a feminist gender? There are, and who take a piece of the Sistine ceiling, you know, and put one of those godlike creatures 
and make that godlike creature look like a woman instead of a man. That's what we had at that meeting. Do they resent the fact that it was not his only begotten daughter? Well, they could work on anything, you see, and I think you just don't emphasize gender, that it, uh -huh. you know, the way people used to. That isn't the way one talks about God today, and one doesn't worry, and certainly one wouldn't improve anything from shifting he to she. Uh -huh. I would prefer to take he and make it reply to the whole human race. You know. Or she. But, no, well, no. she would be much harder to do. Yeah, I see. That's a lot. You know, men are more intractable. Yes and no. <laughs> we have a brief message. We'll be back. <laughs> What else was going on in Stockholm while you were there? It's supposed to be a very swinging place. Well, we, we were entirely preoccupied with the conference because there were so many kinds of conferences. You know, nobody had encouraged anybody to come but governments, mm -hmm. especially our government. They didn't want anybody else there at all. But about 600 people came from non-governmental organizations and gradually got in. And then there was um, a hog farm people came and ran a nice hippie center outside of town that was very peaceful. And then there was a life forum with a lot of American Indians who were brought over. And there was a big forum where all the major issues were discussed, a couple of them. And people, you just went from place to place with all sorts of levels of things happening. Mrs. Gandhi came. And uh, nobody really had much time for swinging outside the conference. There was too much swinging inside. Were you aware of the supposed pornography boom in Stockholm? Yes, people talked about it from time to time, but I didn't see much of it. Yeah. I just wondered if you're aware of the recent uh, anthropological problems in New York City with the uh, theater area and the actors wanting to throw out the, uh, the sinful activities that are going on in the theater area and, and saying that it should be compartmentalized in a certain part of town and that would solve. I think there's a lot to be said for labeling pornography, you know, so people know exactly what it is keeping it under the counter so you know when you get it out from under the counter what you've got. Does pornography occur in all in primitive societies? Touches of it. And the laughter is the same everywhere. And yeah. you can always recognize it. And what, what function does it serve in a, would it serve in a primitive society? Well, in any society that we know anything about, there's some things about sex that are difficult. I mean, people have never managed to handle every aspect of sex comfortably. And you make fun and uh, play with the things that are difficult. The difference is, of course, though, that it, uh, in primitive society, pornography isn't commercialized. The thing that is unpleasant in our society is the commercialization of people's weaknesses. Just a little bawdy laughter doesn't do any harm, although in most societies, there's some people who don't approve. There must be societies where, there's, since there's no total openness about uh, sex, then there could be no such thing as pornography because there nothing connected with the body would be. There never is total openness about everything. I mean, you may have a society never. where you only wear one earring, mm -hmm. but taking that earring off would be indecent. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, yes, that's the thing you have to realize. People go around seductively. <laughs> Something like that. There has never been a society without sexual taboos. No, not as far as we know. Now, you can't, you can't ever say there hasn't been a society, you know, because a lot of the societies have been aren't here. Uh, but you can say that we don't know of any society without taboos. They may be very different sorts of things. But I remember when I was a freshman in college and everybody wore those things over their ears and the freshmen were made to show their ears and they said with great Vigor, I'd rather show my knees than my ears. Wow. And, wow, you know, the skirts were down to your ankles in those days, and that was a big thing to say. Yeah, the expression for a, a lecherous man was that he appreciated a trim ankle always, and that's still used today in some, some cases. Do you know. suppose the young know what, the, what we're talking about when we say that? A trim ankle? Yes. <laughs> why, why, we're the young, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I wa I wonder why there are taboos, and as I think it through, I think it's because the more suppressed it is and the more forbidden it is, the more fun it is. Well, there's that, you know. That's yeah. what I've always thought about nudist colonies. Yeah, that takes the fun out of it. Yeah. They never touch each other, you know, and they put on clothes to dance. Hmm. Who does? Some nudists. 
Now, why do they, they put on clothes in order to... Uh... They're allowed to dance, but they aren't allowed to touch each other when they're nude. They're very, very careful. <laughs> but if you want to dance, you can put on clothes. Yeah. You see? No, I think I you're that right. Makes sense. That, yeah. You know, that if everything is permitted and there's no, no break, no suspicion, no build-up, no climax, life isn't as interesting. I think love was far more interesting when people had to climb over garden walls. Mm. Yes. Yes, I agree. As an old garden wall climber, you yeah. <laughs> never could make it. We have a message. We'll be right back. 